Wow. Thanks, everyone, for joining. This is Sarah from CSAJ. I'm going to give folks just one more minute to log on and join us, and we will begin shortly. Hello and welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you with us today. My name is Sarah. I'm with the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice and I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping um, items as we all get settled in before we hand things off to um, our faculty today. Just a couple of notes. We are recording this webinar and then all the materials including the recording and PowerPoint um, handouts as well as any supplements um, or additional resources that our faculty mentioned today will be posted to our website within a few days. Um, so by probably by the end of the week to our website at csaj.org slash webinars. So, um, and as registered um, attendees, you'll receive direct announcements um, from Zoom and from us about when all of this is available. So just stay tuned for that. We are also streaming live. We have small, um, we have limited capacity in the Zoom room. So if you are in, um, so excited to see you. Um, if you are having trouble um, getting into Zoom or you have some colleagues or friends that are having trouble getting in, please um, check out CSAJ's um, YouTube page where we have a live streaming and we'll be chatting and we'll make sure that you're just as engaged as everyone here in the room. You can also email us at info at csaj.org um, if you have any questions or things that you wanna share and you're not in the room um, and tweet with us. Um, our handle is CSAJ News. Um, please hashtag ReapWeb for all of our webinars. Um, and we also have the handles of our partners today. So please um, chat with us and let us know what you're thinking um, and how everything resonates with you today. A few other things, um, you might be in full screen mo mode. Um, what you can do is just um, click on your toolbar and you can exit out. If you go to view options, you can also double click um, the screen and you can kind of adjust the window size there. Also, you should have some options to um, open the chat, to raise your hand, to ask questions. Please make sure you open the chat tool. I've seen that some folks um, have already done that. So please open that up, say a hello, introduce yourself, talk to us or the panelists, um, and let us know um, kind of what you're thinking. And we'll, we'll start that off um, here in just a minute. If you have any technical issues on the webinar today, please raise your hand and myself, um, who's the host, will make sure to chat with you and try to get you sorted out. And if you're joining us from YouTube, hi, thank you. Steph, our communications fellow, will be chatting with you. Feel free to ask any questions. If similarly you have technical problems, just um, let her know and we'll make sure to, to, to get you taken care of. So again, um, right now I'm going to hand it off to our legal and policy director, Lisa Lynn Jacobs, um, to kind of introduce us and set us up for the, the call today. Thanks so much, Lisa Lynn. Thanks so much, Sarah, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I am Lisa Lynn Jacobs. I am the legal and policy director for the Center for Survivor Ag Agency and Justice. Um, and welcome to this next in a series of webinars that we are doing about the intersection of domestic and sexual violence and racial equity issues. 
Today, we are going to be looking at intersectional solutions, advancing racial and economic equity for survivors of color and immigrant survivors, part two. Um, I believe Sarah shared this, but all of the webinars that have been part of this series uh, can be accessed from CSAJ's website, csaj.org. So if you've missed one or more, feel free to um, catch up on those at your leisure. Uh, I am so looking forward to today's webinar and to hearing from our faculty. From the Institute on Gender-Based Violence, we have Chick Dobby, the Executive Director, and Sarah Khan, the Project Specialist. And from the Texas Council on Family Violence, we will be hearing from Krista Delgallo, the policy manager, and Mona Morrow, who is a policy coordinator. Next, as we are beginning, we'd like to know who is in the room. I think we've got some, we did some initial questions when we invited people to sign up for the webinar, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, if you can chat to us about what your role is, where you're from, uh, you know, what your title is as appropriate, the perspective that you are bringing to the webinar, we'd be very interested to get that background. Right, as I shared before, um, we asked some of these questions as a sort of precursor to doing the call. Uh, some people who've been joined, who are joining, have uh, taken part in our racial impact self-assessment. And so we wanted to start out by offering a little bit of feedback in terms of what people shared in that context. We asked uh, people who did the self-assessment what from their perspective were the top institutional barriers that their clients or the people that they were working with were seeing. And what you are seeing here on the screen is the top three responses we got to that question. Uh, for the vast majority of respondents, housing access and affordability was a struggle that their client was dealing with followed by at 54% family law matters and at 46% legal and immigration status. And this dovetails wonderfully with the information that our panelists will be sharing with us shortly. Um, to the extent that these issues resonate for you and for the clients that you advocate for, um, can you share with us as to any of these three uh, a particular example, uh, either of the housing struggles that your clients are sharing or why you think they're having those particular challenges. If it's a legal or an immigration issue, what is a specific example of something that you are seeing your clients deal with? Or are there examples that are recurring repeatedly as you are advocating for your clients? The same with respect to family law matters, and if there are any distinctions to be made across racial or ethnic groups, we would love to hear that information as well. Please share that with us in the chat. And this is Erica Sussman. I'm just seeing a lot of um, responses from folks. I just want to um, mention that both in terms of where people are from and the variety and richness of their experience. So really folks from all over the country. Um, in terms of the question that you just posed, Lisa Lynn, I see um, some of the responses related to, um, one person says, some clients have a history of evictions and cannot find places willing to let them rent or buy again. Um, so talking about the housing and access affordability aspect of, of this slide. If folks have other responses to this, please share them with us. Yeah, I'm seeing some as well, Erica, particularly um, that in the housing context, people have issues with arrest records or that um, there, those are issues for DV offenders and that people who are on probation are also having issues. Um, 
which is not surprising given the discretion that uh, housing authorities often have and the ways in which they exercise that discretion, often to the detriment of survivors who uh, otherwise should have access to public housing or may have a Section 8 voucher, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also seeing some folks talking about the collateral consequences of arrest when seeking protection through the protection order courts and the implications for housing and so many other areas there as well. And similarly, in the immigration context, uh, people are raising having clients arrested when they're trying to seek protection orders at court and how that connects to their immigration status. And I'm also seeing people talking about clients getting evicted, having trouble finding housing, and the way in which DV follows people from place to place. I am guessing, I'm sure people can share with me in the chat, that part of that is that the housing authority tends to check, uh, do criminal background checks and other things. So perhaps they can find out if you have a protection order, certainly if you've been a subject of dual arrest or otherwise had some interaction with the criminal justice system that is connected with uh, a client's identity as a survivor, that that may then have implications for their ability to get housing or for a landlord's determination about whether or not to give them a lease. All right, well, um, please uh, feel free and we hope that you will share, continue to share some more of how you're seeing these institutional barriers appear in your work with survivors. Um, you know, in, in preparation for today, um, I, I know that many folks um, completed a, a self-assessment um, and shared some rich information with us. And so we appreciate that and we continue to learn from you. Um, and hopefully today's program will be able to um, engage you in some cross learning with us. So thank you. So I wanna give, um, again, I had mentioned uh, earlier, my name is Erica Sussman and I'm the director of the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Um, for those who are new to working with us, CSAJ promotes advocacy approaches that remove systemic barriers, enhance organizational responses, and improve professional practices to meet the self-defined needs of domestic and sexual violence survivors. This mission is part of our larger vision, um, which is that CSAJ envisions a world where all people have equal access to physical safety, economic security, and human dignity. Just very briefly, uh, we have three key projects that are uh, currently operating and are and are very much um, intertwined in terms of the work that we do. One of our projects is our Consumer Rights for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Initiative. The other is our Racial and Economic Equity Project, of which today's webinar is a part as well as our Accounting for Economic Security Atlas project. So um, some of the responses today actually uh, related to the self-assessment really lift up the intersection between consumer and economic rights and racial um, inequality. So um, today's program will hopefully bring many of those things into the foreground. Very briefly, um, today's webinar is part of a project that was launched in early 2016, and that is our Racial and Economic Equity for Survivors project, otherwise known as the REAP project. REAP seeks to increase grantee capacity to address racial and other structural and institutional biases that pose barriers to economic stability for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And we carry out our work 
through a number of different activities. One is through our impact sites on the ground work that is being done in, with two incredibly powerful uh, sites to uh, effectuate the overarching mission. And those two sites are in La Se Comunitario as well as OKC Artists for Justice. We're also engaged in an impact assessment and national strategic impact agenda. I'll talk more about those later today. We also have a webinar series, as you know, as well as a legal impact resource library. And we are gathering stories to um, facilitate policy and systems change work through our survivor story core. And of course, we have technical assistance as ongoing. I want to um, acknowledge our critical partners in this work, two of whom are on the call today, as well as some others who are um, not faculty, but are certainly informing our work on a daily basis and leading much of our work. And um, one of our partners is the Women of Color Network. Another is the Southwest Center for Law and Public Policy. Another is Asian Pacific Institute. Institute on Gender-Based Violence, joining us as faculty today, Casa de Esperanza, and the Texas Council on Family Violence, also joining us as faculty. Um, other partners include the Kirwan Institute on Race and Ethnicity, as well as two consultants, Bill Kennedy and Camille Holmes. Before we launch into the substance of today, um, here's an overview of what we expect participants to walk away with. One is an understanding of how gender-based violence interlocks with economic insecurity and marginalization, particularly for Asian Pacific survivors. Two is an awareness of how an intersectional framework informs practice. And third are some concrete ways to engage in policy, and or systems change to address economic disparities facing marginalized survivors. So um, with that, as background, I'd like to hand the program over to Chick and Sara. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, this is Sarah Khan and Chick Dabby. On the, uh, we are with the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence. And um, Sarah, am I controlling the screen? Okay. And, yes, you uh, are. Uh, Excited to have you. <laughs> <laughs> good to have you too, All right. So we basically, and, um, a national resource center and we address domestic violence, other forms of violence, and also provide um, some uh, training and, in, uh, and uh, on critical issues. We do provide um, intervention, advocacy, and prevention uh, around uh, issues like abusive international marriages, and we offer lots of resources. This is just a um, snapshot of our website, so we encourage you to go there and see more um, information that we have there for you. And uh, we basically, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about API. Uh, so the next slide is about Asia. Not sure how many people know what Asia um, is the largest continent, and the Pacific Islands are uh, also considered a part of, um, of that part of the world. And then about the people of um, Asia and Pacific Islanders, there are so many. I think the point, the point, point that I would walk you to walk, want you to walk away with is that it's an extremely diverse community. And the one part that we do the, at the Institute work with is uh, West Asia. It's also called the Far East or the Middle East. And so it um, includes uh, a lot of countries like uh, Iran, Jordan, Lebanon. And so we also consider them a part of um, the people that we work with. And then um, 
Asians, although um, according to the model minority stereotype, are could be uh, are considered to be very well educated and literate, and they are like they could be uh, speaking many different languages, could be multilingual, but for uh, they are. Uh, limited in their English proficiency, which then later on, like Chick will explain, uh, become you know it plays out in different ways, whether getting a job or and uh, other economic hurdles that come their way. And um, and the reason why we talk about that is because the Asian Pacific Islander population is amongst the fastest growing population, but it also is the fastest growing poverty populations in the wake of recessions. And um, again, this is in sharp contrast to the perception that as the model minorities, the Asian American Pacific Islanders have been doing well in recent years. And um, our uh, ethnic, uh, because we are an ethnically diverse community, the composition of people in poverty is also diverse. And uh, the wi there's widespread poverty rates amongst ethnicities. So, uh, for example, overall, if you look at this chart, if you can even see properly, um, the Chinese and the Asian uh, Indians and the Vietnamese make up the top percentile of people who fall in the poverty index. But if you look at the poverty rate, the highest concentration of poverty is, are amongst the Hmong and the Bangladeshis. And again, this plays out in different ways um, when we work with those communities. And then also uh, food insecurity, um, it, it affects nearly one out of every 10 Asian American and Pacific Islander. I uh, just wanted to put that out of this. And uh, like I mentioned before, we are one of the fastest growing population in the United States of America, still very tiny compared to the other ethnicities, but, um, are growing at a, a high rate. And, okay. uh, this is Chick Dabby. I will be talking about some of the intersectional frameworks and connecting up gender inequality and gender violence and how uh, that forms a sort of uh, infrastructure uh, and a substratum for economic uh, inequity. So, um, I uh, want to just uh, iterate that we are a national resource center, so we provide uh, training and technical assistance to programs, Asian Pacific Islander programs in the country that address uh, various forms of gender-based violence. And as a national resource center, we have actually been working on the issue of economic security uh, since 2003 and emphasizing the gendered nature of economic insecurity and then how it actually interlocks uh, with the forms of gender-based violence we see in our communities. So um, just uh, some global data, first some global data and estimated 60% of uh, chronically hungry people worldwide are women and girls. Uh, women, of course, bear disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care work, as we care work for, as we all know. Uh, women also hold very small uh, presence in political office, and uh, three out of every ten women uh, globally report experiencing physical and/or sexual violence. Therefore, underlining the fact that home is in fact a dangerous space. Next slide. Um, this uh, point about home being a dangerous place is confirmed here um, uh, when we look at data on gender violence and Asians and Pacific Islanders. So 21 to 55% of women report experiencing intimate partner violence. This is US-based data. Um, one in three report sexual violence. This is based on CDC's NISVA studies. 64% uh, of Indian and Pakistani women experienced sexual assault in a study that we did um, that was done by the Institute. And 41% of 160 South Asian women in Boston reported experiencing domestic violence over their lifetime. Uh, next. So this brings us to the issue of violence over the lifetime. Uh, and um, the purpose uh, of the lifetime spiral of gender-based violence is to really uh, show 
uh, the kinds of exposure that women and girls have over the life course. Sometimes the abuse may occur in only one stage of the lifetime uh, or it may continue across stages. And um, sometimes there may not be actual experiences of violence, but there is vulnerability uh, that comes from exposure. So if you know that uh, your sister is being molested by an older brother or by your father, uh, even though that uh, the unmolested uh, sister is not directly harmed, uh, she still experiences the uh, level of vulnerability and lives in a climate of fear. So we look at both violence over the life course as uh, both exposure to incidents as well as vulnerability. And what the life course violence shows is that uh, abuse that is enacted in the home and then moves over uh, is now enacted on women's bodies. Next. Um, so uh, three things that I want to point out that the lifetime spiral demonstrates. Firstly, that violence against women is historical in, in nature. It's not accidental. It's not about bad luck, bad judgment. It's not a single event. Uh, and this is an important point to make because so much, uh, so many of our communities, uh, the level of victim blaming in our communities uh, makes it seem like it's a single event and then it gets treated that way. Uh, and somehow that it's the women's fault. The second uh, issue that the lifetime spiral conveys is that there are many types of abuses and vulnerabilities, as I mentioned, over the life course. Three, uh, we see the various perpetrators located across the life course. So um, we have, uh, so women are not just abused in the domestic violence situation by their partner, but by um, different perpetrators, which then of course increases vulnerability, increases sexism and misogyny. And uh, in recent political climate, we have actually been seeing that very palpable increase in misogyny. Um, so actually one other point I want to make about uh, life force violence is that um, what this impacts when you have different abusers over the life course, et cetera, is that help seeking behavior is also impacted. And many times um, women have negative experiences uh, and negative histories of help seeking. And that also then yeah, impacts their ability to seek help in the present when there's domestic violence. So what does gender-based violence, devaluation, and sexism over the life course result in? Uh, obviously, it can have a debilita debilitating effect on women's ability in the economic sphere. <clears throat> it also means that many of the spaces that contribute to everyone's economic empowerment and economic development and growth are, in fact, dangerous spaces. And it results in compromising women as economic actors. What I want to emphasize here that Violence does this, but also broader cultures of gender-based violence, where there's devaluation and sexism, contribute to all these outcomes. Next slide. So how does life course abuse and sexism compromise women as economic actors? If you just think uh, over the life course, what we're seeing for a child growing up in a home where there's uh, where the mother is being abused isn't conducive to a good, good environment to study in and get good grades. Bullying in the school makes school a dangerous and lonely place. Um, sexual abuse by clergy means that religious institutions are in fact not places of spiritual refuge. Uh, sexual violence on campus, of course, inhibits learning. Um, and uh, harassment in the military in all kinds of jobs means that workplaces are not very productive. Uh, the, uh, the, um, in the US military, women have a higher chance of being raped uh, than being killed in combat. Um, uh, homophobia in homes, in many API communities, there are strong levels of homophobia and homophobia is, uh, uh, then subjects, you know, people feel subjugated. And it actually, in the home, parental homophobia just then makes spaces of love and desire dangerous. 
uh, lifelong physical injuries, chronic pain. There are 25-year-olds who cannot pick up a bag of groceries because of injuries they've had. So all those things contribute to not being able to function. There are women who have been uh, out of an abusive relationship for 30 years and are still just getting all their teeth replaced or getting a hip replacement uh, because of the abuse. So there are really lifelong um, impacts of, of uh, gender violence. Okay. And if you have other examples, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Okay. So our screen is... I think our screen froze, Sarah. Could you so help? Next slide, please. So uh, how do we... Um, so how do we operationalize in this understanding of intersectionality and how does it operationalize into practice? What does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, how um, does our own as advocates, our own uh, understanding, theoretical understanding of intersectionality and our lived experiences of intersectional identities, how does that translate into practice when we're addressing gender-based violence? Um, I'm going to uh, reference here a report that the Institute recently did, uh, which outlines a model that has grown out of um, API um, uh, programs. It's called the A to Z advocacy model. And um, uh, there are a few principles I want to identify here. Uh, there's the analysis of intersectionality and patriarchy. And what I want to point out here is uh, you saw the analysis that we presented earlier and that that analysis, in fact, is um, integrated into the way programs work, um, the analysis that presents in the lifetime spiral. And um, the issue of patriarchy comes up in our communities fairly frequently and is often not understood outside the Asian context but patriarchy is really about, is not only about the oppression of um, uh, women by men, but patriarchy is actually about maintaining the status quo of power between men and men, women and women, and men and women. So it is much more about, it is, it is more than violence and assertion of control uh, through patriarchal oppression, but there is this intersection of how power equality are all compromised uh, through patriarchy. So um, the other principle that uh, many API programs are, are based on is that uh, delivering survivor-centered advocacy means having a culturally specific analysis of gender and gender violence. And here I just want to highlight, for example, with domestic violence in many Asian homes, abuse is not just enacted by male partners, but also by male and female in-laws, which means you have multiple perpetrators and uh, against a single victim. And you can uh, only un you can easily understand how each of the forms of abuse are exacerbated and economic abuse can include can come from many different abusers in the home. Uh, so by having these uh, broad definitions and understanding these dynamics of uh, domestic and sexual violence in Asian families, uh, what that means for advocacy is being able to integrate uh, some of the remedies uh, based on this. So one example could be that for many, uh, for many women, uh, jewelry given at marriage is then withheld by from the woman by her in-laws. And uh, in many uh, legal and uh, civil remedies, it's very important for advocates to understand the symbolic meaning of this jewelry being returned to the woman that received it as a gift. Um, so uh, another principle that I just want to uh, mention here uh, in how intersectionality is operationalized is this understanding of the marge of our marginalized identities and how this marginalized identity is used first by abusers to increase uh, victimization and vulnerability, and then also, of course, uh, connects right up to how systems. Uh, addressed uh, marginalized uh, women and girls in their 
seeking their services. Uh, let me just take uh, the uh, example of immigration. Uh, one of the reasons that we've seen also this increase and uptick in uh, immig- uh, people being picked up at courthouses, etc., is because it is abusers who are informing immigrant uh, authorities and uh, and ICE that their partner is out of status and will be at a certain location and can be arrested there. So this identity is used as a tool of abuse, and hence we see how important it is to understand that piece uh, and those expressions of gender-based violence. Um, I'm going to go to, so th- there are some other principles that you see over here. Oh, I, I just want to clarify about uh, the next point uh, about uh, addressing family and community generated barriers. Uh, many times in our work, we look at systems generated barriers, which are, of course, uh, uh, completely significant and central to economic security. But there are also family and community generated barriers. One of the things we're seeing from refugee programs is that as men are uh, going into um, uh, work uh, uh, in enrichment programs, learning English, et cetera, so that they can start working here, um, women are being prevented from actually participating in those programs because priority has to be given to male members in the family to find jobs. So we see how those family and community generated barriers uh, connect up to the identity of women uh, refugees. Okay, next. So uh, over here, uh, again, um, with systems, we have so many experiences and examples. And as the survey showed in in the introductory remarks mentioned that there are so many problems around uh, how systems uh, uh, are barriers to services, which indeed they are. One of the things that uh, we see in many API programs is the work that is being done so that systems advocacy can be used to build gateways to services and mitigate these barriers. And uh, of course, the importance of building gateways to services is to increase access, which also showed up as one of the big issues that affect um, economic security. Um, I uh, just want to um, mention a couple of examples that uh, the Institute is working on. Uh, So in the point about institutionalizing policy advocacy and addressing barriers faced by immigrants and refugees, there's a lot of work being done nationally and at the Institute on housing and housing first policies and how those policies can impact uh, survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, There's also work being done on immigration. So uh, there are immense barriers uh, going up all the time and being enforced uh, against uh, immigrants in our communities. So uh, the Institute has developed, uh, done multiple trainings and materials. One of the webinars we did had 2,000 people on it. So it was just kind of, there's an extraordinary uh, amount of information and need Mm. to address these barriers. and uh, in the family law sphere, which was also brought up, uh, again, you know, we uh, look at training uh, 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 child custody evaluators, for example, about how uh, the extended family home may look more attractive. But in fact, if there are multiple perpetrators in that home, it is not in the best interest of the child to be placed there. Um, just going to the last point on this PowerPoint, uh, how programs have been integrating tools for economic security. Uh, we're going to now turn to Sarah Khan to provide that information. Sure, thank you. Um, so our programs, um, as we know, have been very resilient. Sarah, could you please switch the slide? Thank you. So uh, our programs have been very resilient in meeting the needs of our um, Asian Pacific Islander survivors. According to our report, uh, 31% of the 160 Asian Pacific Islander serving domestic violence programs address economic security. And so economic security looks different in each uh, 
program, right? And some examples, and we'll, I'll be more than happy to chat about that um, at a, um, on a later at a later note. Is that uh, one of the pro one of our agencies, uh, one of the local programs here in the Bay Area, has a seed program, uh, which is an example that uh, they tap into the resilience, creativity, and practicality of uh, the survivors that we work with and teach economic literacy, uh, decision-making, and money management skills. Uh, oftentimes we see that people in this country could be documented, but really have no access to their uh, monies or assets. So uh, pro some programs set up scholarship funds, either for the survivors to go to school or uh, for their children. Uh, there are places where there, uh, people may not have access or don't qualify for pro bono attorneys. So then there could be an interest-free loan that a person uh, a survivor says that they would pay back at a later time in monthly installments. And these loans could be for housing, could be for, uh, well, they're mostly used for legal services because we know that a lot of uh, that domestic violence just doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? I mean, economic, along with economic security, uh, we also have a lot of legal questions. And, and oftentimes it's not just in the family uh, law uh, sphere, it's also in the immigration law, uh, law and child custody and things like that. Uh, other times people have, been, um, have come together and opened up uh, giving circles. And then um, actually an agency in South uh, in uh, New York uh, found that um, training to screen for economic abuse and uh, funding for them made them uh, made them open up um, an individual development account for low income individuals citywide, which was primarily uh, Saki was the agency and it's primarily their survivors that they work for. They provide, this agency provides case management, workshops, IDAs, and scholarships for women so they can uh, access public benefits, jobs, credit, banking, and other forms of support. We also see, uh, we also know that um, that's not the only place, right? These are the tangible places. Oftentimes, um, people from these agencies, either staff or volunteer accompany survivors to court, uh, to, the, uh, to the social services offers and, um, offices and, and offer their services and help them with lang uh, language access. Um, we also know that a 30-day or a 60-day shelter stay um, oftentimes is not enough. In fact, in our programs, we have found out that that is really not enough because at that time, the survivor is in crisis mode and dealing with the then and now of what is going to happen. What happens after they move out of there and let's say get into a transitional home, that's when all the uh, their past trauma uh, comes forward. And it, that's also a place for people where uh, they realize that they need more training. So some, some agencies like my sister's house in Sacramento opened up um, a cafe where they train folks. They're using the skills that the survivors have and need and have an interest in, and then add um, how to work with them, uh, how to work, uh, you know, how to get like simple trainings. Uh, License to Freedom is another agency. They work with um, they work with the survivors to obtain driving licenses. They offer learners permit classes in Arabic. Uh, after all, it learn and then also uh, pretty much everybody has an LEP program because English learning is an important cornerstone of uh, economic security. Um, I do see some questions that are being asked, and I f and I think we can address them in the Q and A part. Uh, for now, I'm going to ask Chick to uh, close us out. That's true. Uh, so, Sarah, could you take us back? So we and these agencies also do have some strategic approaches, you know, uh, to address uh, economic security. Some, uh, some mitigating divorce separated separation related economic funds oftentimes we see our population uh, goes through forced divorce forced marriage forced pregnancy uh, that 
that pretty much leads to a person not not being able to rise economically. We've also seen a trend of marry and dump, which then means that person is considered, maybe considered used and then also lives in a limbo. Uh, we've seen people get married, growing brought to this country, then taken back and then just abandoned there. Uh, we, I think I mentioned this before, we also see withholding of assets. Um, oftentimes assets are trans, uh, transferred to their parents or their extended family members, leaving the spouse uh, or partner um, without access to any monies. And then the same thing with an Islamic marriage contract and divorce, culture plays a huge part. I mean, an Islamic marriage contract is a contract. You can actually have stipulations in it. You could talk about uh, what you want put in it, you know, um, some preconditions that you may have, and then divorce. But people use a lot of customs and also don't realize that there is a difference between ending a marriage in a religious court or in a religious manner and then the civil court. Um, and but they, but our programs have also uh, been working with the you know with the immigrant Asian survivors. So we do a lot of uh, we've seen our programs do a lot of our self petitions. We we see them ask for gender asylum applications. Uh, oftentimes, clients are helped um, with obtaining their EADs, um, transnational child support. And I think this is something that the Institute also uh, really works with our advocates on for language access in courts and systems and extensive policy advocacy at national, state, and local levels. And an example for that would be uh, there's an agency out in Georgia that really, really pet petitioned for um, H4 visa holders, that would be the de dependent spouses of H1B visa holders, um, and advocated for successfully work authorization for them under WABA, which was not there before. So this is Chick. So I just wanted to underscore the point here that these are many of the types of violence and the harms that uh, you know uh, result in very clear economic problems, uh, but that programs are working on mitigating some of the issues that arise in these forms of gender-based violence. Uh, finally, we just want to close by asking the question, what can money, privilege, and power do? Many of us in this field, um, because we are constantly dealing with the abuses of power, uh, we uh, sometimes can overlook that power is a good thing to have. It's important. It allows us to make change, uh, as does money. These are all um, important parts of our society in what needs to be done is that they need to be redistributed. So equality is often seen as sort of trying to struggle to some idealized norm, uh, but in fact, equality is about a redistribution of power and resources. So what privilege and power can do is to redistribute those resources. The way we can work is to, it can, of course, alleviate poverty, uh, food insecurity, income, housing insecurity. Uh, the important piece is also to understand how uh, we need to build well-being for all. So it's not only for people harmed by gender violence or, or disenfranchised because of their social marginalization but, uh, and, their, uh, and their identities, but we need to build well-being for all. You know, childcare everywhere is good for everyone, whether people are being abused or not. And we need to invest in people, not just services for them. And finally, uh, we at the Institute use this concept of building gender democracy, where we can bring in the elements of gender equality, equity, and justice. And I want to leave you with the thought that women spend 90% of their income on families, and men spend 30 to 40% of their income on the family. So we see immediately how there is this huge disparity and how building gender democracy can be one of the ways that money, privilege, and power can benefit us. Thank you. Back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Chick and Sara, for that very rich presentation. Um, I can see from the chat box that it has generated some thinking and some comments on these issues. Uh, if there are other ways in which the presentation has resonated with you in the audience or 
caused you to think about particular issues in your own work, now would be a great opportunity to share those. I saw somebody reflecting, for instance, um, during, I believe it was the part where Chick was sharing about how the violence that can exist in a family in this context may not only be violence that is being perpetrated by a spouse, but by other family members. And uh, someone from the audience raised that when trans and non-binary individuals experience violence that is based on their gender expression, that too is a violating of the patriarchal norms of gender and that it's also connected to that particular part of the presentation. Are there other ways in which the, um, the presentation resonated or issues that people want to raise at this point? I saw that you know there was an expression of interest. I think that this particular part of the presentation has been so helpful because although we have been having a robust discussion, say for the last six months about uh, new federal immigration policies, we do not always, when we see it, turn up in the media, there's not enough digging into the issue sometimes to give us a sense of how those policies may be experienced differently in different immigrant communities. How the Latino community is experiencing these issues may be significantly different from what we heard today in terms of the experience of the Asian immigrant community can also be different for the African or the Caribbean community as well. Are there other kinds of issues that this part of the presentation has raised that people want to share? I see that people are asking if they will be getting a copy of the presentation. The answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> I saw also that some people were asking I think they were reacting to some discussion about uh, immigrant survivors seeking protection orders at the courthouse and being apprehended. People were asking about how that interacts with the protections of the Violence Against Women Act, which I am certain could be, and in fact has been the subject of other webinars. Um, but I am going to invite Chick and Sara at this point if they want to, to talk about that very briefly, and then we will transition uh, to the presentation from the Texas Coalition and continue this part of the dialogue in the chat. But if there are particular issues, Chick and Sara, that you want to talk about at this moment, um, about the way in which the AP Institute has been responding to policy, federal policy changes on immigration issues and what that has meant for your clients. Maybe that's a good way for us to transition. Uh, yes, thank you. This is Chick uh, from the Asian Pacific Institute. I want to um, uh, say that we have been doing several webinars and also uh, we are currently developing some materials that we, we will be posting on our website. It's hard to answer uh, specific uh, questions uh, about uh, the various remedies and uh, the sort of uh, pretty devastating and horrible impact of enforcement and what that is, you know, the, there's always a chilling effect. That's the uh, important uh, takeaway is that these policies, of course, increase women's vulnerability, increase their uh, endangerment levels, increase male impunity, abuser impunity, and uh, this then causes also a chilling effect uh, for, for everyone, and there's less reporting, less utilization of services. So uh, what I would just say is to, you know, connect up uh, to our listserv if you want to join it, and we are doing um, several trainings and webinars. One of the issues also to keep in mind is that as policies change um, very fast, um, we, it's, it's uh, important to, be, to keep uh, being careful and cautious about what uh, information we give. And it's really important to connect up for all community-based programs to connect up with the immigration uh, law uh, providers in their communities so that 
there isn't any um, inadvertent consequence of giving uh, legal information or advice about immigration strategies and remedies that's incorrect. Because the policies are changing, there's a risk of it being uh, of, of advocates not knowing exactly what the current situation is. And so it's really important for it to team up because many immigrants uh, law attorneys don't know what the domestic violence issues are. So uh, I, I would really suggest keep uh, getting trained. Do not just use um, a website. Do not just, you know, uh, troll websites to see, oh, what can we do about this or that or their issue? But make sure that you have the current information before you suggest uh, remedies and take steps. Thank you. Uh, I I just wanted to quickly ta uh, just answer Linda's question. I absolutely think it is very important to discuss law enforcement response to immigrants and uh, how it perpetrates the violence, keeping victims from seeking assistance. And I also wanted to add that it's not just something that's happened in the current political climate. I speak specifically to the Asians population. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of that since 9-11. It's like, do we talk about our communities and get deported or do we continue to work with uh, law enforcement? Also, oftentimes, culturally, given that people come from communities where law enforcement is not looked upon very favorably, people may not have had good uh, examples with them. And also you expect law enforcement to just give a slap on the wrist maybe. So people already um, ha do not ask for uh, assistance. And, um, and oftentimes law enforcement is used as threats, like saying that if you, if you speak up, I'm going to report you to the police. Who do you think the police is going to um, reach out to? So I would definitely say, um, keeping that in mind, see the culture and the country they come from before even offering law enforcement as somebody for assistance. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chicken Sara. Um, and to the extent that people have other reactions about this part of the presentation or the framework or how they are using that in their own work, please feel free to chat that. We are now going to move to the next question and the next set of presentations that are centered on the question of what are strategies for changing systems at the state level. Um, and for that, I am pleased to welcome our faculty from the Texas Council on Family Violence, Krista Delgallo and Mona Morrow. You all might need to unmute yourselves if you have not. Mona, are you with us? Can you hear us now? Yes. Yes, all right. Okay, our first attempt at unmuting did not work. I apologize. <laughs> This is Krista Delgallo with the Texas Council on Family Violence, and we, uh, both myself and Mona, appreciate this opportunity to um, be present on this webinar with all the participants and certainly the esteemed faculty in the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Um, we're going to be speaking briefly about our approach at the Texas Council on Family Violence to economic advocacy and this work and some of the things that we've learned and some of the strategies that we've utilized. Because both Mona and I sit on the policy team, we really have encountered the economic work from a policy perspective and a policy approach. And certainly many of the economic barriers that survivors of intimate partner violence face are um, legal barriers and as Chick and Sara pointed out, there also um, can be very structural and historical barriers. And likewise, many of the protections and hopefully pathways to some type of mitigation of some of those barriers come through law and policy oftentimes. But in saying that, I want to recognize 
Um, again, as Sarah highlighted from some of the amazing work that the different programs that they support are engaged in, in terms of economic advocacy, policy and law are not the only approach to doing this work. And it really takes recognizing the spectrum of work that is being done by all of the amazing advocates out in the field with survivors working towards economic equity with survivors. Um, and we really do policy, we do policy and systems change work here at the Texas Council. We also do um, work that is really to build the capacity of our local programs that so that they can be the sort of highest realm of economic advocates um, if survivors do choose to go and encounter the domestic violence services system. And we're going to provide some description of that work, and I want to sort of mention that it goes in many different directions. So the systems themselves inform us. We have to ourselves be very informed by what types of systems survivors are interacting with and how they work and how we can even work towards change in those systems. Um, and, and likewise, the field, the advocates, the survivors um, also inform us by the type of work that they're doing and the type of needs that they are raising as what needs to be our priorities. And to that extent, we're going to talk about a couple specific um, avenues of this work in terms of the consumer work, the housing and child support work that TCFE has been engaged in over the last couple of years. So we are a statewide coalition. I saw in the opening chat that there's several other state coalitions, both domestic violence and sexual assault on the call. Um, and so we are one of those coalitions, um, sister coalitions across the state. We have three main focus areas around supporting our programs, around supporting um, prevention efforts and policy advocacy. And so we really see our a, a main role of, of ourselves as coalitions uh, into helping move work at the state level, but also helping to empower advocates and survivors to move work and make connection at the local level. We've been very fortunate um, for the past four to five years to be working closely with CSAJ on their economic work initially with their consumer um, initiative. Um, and that has really helped to motivate us as a coalition to get more deeply involved in economic issues and a variety of economic issues impacting survivors and also to continue to work in connection and coalition, not just among um, violence prevention folks, but also anti-poverty and racial equity groups. And so particularly through the Consumer Rights Initiative, which was our first um, entree with the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice, it helps us to start to meet other groups that were doing advocacy work, um, particularly around payday lending. And it really helps us to be challenged by those groups to say, hey, you know, the vast majority of the people that we are working to protect, that we are working on in community, are low-income single mothers of color. Um, so this is your issue too, domestic violence advocates. Um, and so we really saw that as as a motivating factor to get more involved in the consumer issues that particularly when survivors are coming from other layers of marginalization can have um, just an increased amount of havoc on their long-term financial stability. And then moving forward, as we've started this work on the racial and economic equity project, it's enabled us as a coalition and as you know, what I would call a mainstream state coalition to be able to be more informed and connected to this very smart work and this structure to look at equity and to really put a name and to talk about race um, as connected to economic abuse, to economic insolvency, and as a, as a, a part and parcel to our economic advocacy. It's also been extraordinarily helpful to, to review and to engage with the analysis like that of the Asian Pacific Islander Institute that they shared so that we can start to see our work from not only a policy framework, but then also sort of layer on at that additional lens of that analysis.
one of the ways in which I think that just from the get-go doing economic work from the state coalition perspective and from the policy perspective for domestic violence um, or anti-domestic violence advocates um, is part and parcel to racial equity work and intersectional work is because it's it's what has been bubbling up for from survivors from sort of time immemorial. Anyone that's done direct advocacy work with survivors knows that economic issues tend to be forefront. Um, concerns for how um, parents are going to be able to maintain their families and maintain stability for their families long term tends to be at the forefront of survivors' minds, and particularly in survivors coming from communities of color and other marginalized communities and survivors that are coming from the immigrant or LGBT communities that are that have limited access to other types of opportunities and have been telling our domestic violence advocacy movement for a long time that the criminal legal system is not the system that they really are wanting to engage with um, to resolve the issues that they're dealing with. They want to find other types of solutions. Um, and even to the extent that the civil legal system might not necessarily be exactly the, the main solution for for all survivors. So given that protective orders, divorces are not necessarily the number one priority of all survivors, but oftentimes just the long-term stability of their families, their ability to um, regularize their status and not constantly fear deportation and all of these type of issues tend to be paramount. And so um, I feel like our ability to engage in this work is extraordinarily important, not to leave the other work in systems behind, but to also infuse that with not only this analysis, but also to add on to these additional needs. And I think that one of the examples that Chick's voice come, resonated with me as coming from um, Jill Davies' um, framework from her domestic violence advocacy book around life-generated risk. So even if someone is coming from either a background of poverty or a background without citizenship status, that isn't caused by the abuser, and even if the abuser is still within that same community and that same identity group, the abuser can still utilize that marginality to increase the survivor's vulnerability. And I know um, in, in my particular advocacy, I had an immigrant client whose undocumented immigrant abuser called her employer and said, I know she is not legally working and you need to fire her. So in one fell swoop, he had her fired um, and really outed her as an undocumented immigrant, making her far less safe, um, diminishing her economic solvency. And he was coming from the same set, right? Um, but still was able to capitalize upon that vulnerability. And to the extent that our advocacy work can start to mitigate and ameliorate abusers' ability to use those other, those structural inequity tools, I think is really important. And even in our economic advocacy, and Bone is going to talk more about some of the specific examples, we've seen that while we might have started looking very specifically at um, things like public benefits, um, really looking at how often, how, how much survivors don't tend to, nobody really likes to go into the public benefits office. Most people don't feel like they're treated with dignity and respect. It's not, um, it's not sort of the main goal of most people. So really looking at how do we help people to find affordable housing in the communities that they want to live in? How do we help people to find employment even though they're facing multiple barriers to employment? It might be, um, as the institute staff were saying, um, dangerous spaces for survivors. How do we help make those kinds of spaces that can symbolize economic gain actually safer for survivors that are programs and we are serving and representing? This is just um, a little bit of an understanding of where we are in Texas. Um, I actually looked at this and thought we looked a lot better than, than I thought we were. Um, but as you can see, Texas is, 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 a, is among a, one of the poorer states. We do have the highest rate of uninsured children in the state. We have the highest rate of rapid repeat teen pregnancy. We have a very high rate of immigrants and of English language learners in our state. And 
So that in doing any type of advocacy work in Texas, we have to understand that this is the context in which we are working. And in doing work with for and on behalf of all survivors, then we have to make sure that we're working um, paramount to work for those survivors that have the, the most vulnerabilities and the most barriers. Um, and one of the things that's just inextricably linked are is race and ethnicity and poverty in our state and and most likely throughout the country. Um, and so and we we really see that in doing any direct service work here in the state, you absolutely see that um, that your um, that it is much harder for a lot of people to really um, to come out of poverty and an experience of poverty that are people of color that are also having challenges with the criminal legal system with th that are facing discrimination in both their housing and employment spaces um, that are not they're not getting a fair shake in any type of civil court because of their race or ethnicity and I'm going to let Mona talk some, about some of our specific work in terms of housing and child support moving forward. Um, thanks, Krista. And Krista did a great job of demonstrating that intersection of poverty um, and, and race and that intersectionality. We're going to look specifically at two primary economic systems that we at TCSC um, have strategically done a lot of work in, um, and we've done that because survivors of color are intersecting with these specific systems, um, beginning with um, different housing systems and then the 4D child support system. So I, I thought it was um, really, I was, I was very happy that we were able to get some of those statistics up at the beginning of the um, webinar today, and it really did segue into um, identifying the, the need and, and warranting our, our kind of first topic, which is on uh, is on housing and the disparities um, and our work that we've done within this particular system. Um, at the onset, when Sarah and Lisa Lynn put up the statistics from the survey, it said that 77% um, of people who took the survey, participants here today that took the survey, stated that um, housing access and affordability were, were or was the primary or most identified um, institutional barrier that, that, um, that the feedback um, showed. So I think it just happened to, to um, really correspond to what we see and what we hear from our member programs that housing is 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 right up there in um, in the topic areas that that survivors um, are experiencing and and really that we need to continue to put at the forefront of our work. Um, so in talking about that, the pieces that we've seen at TCFE, um, primarily looking at um, public housing. Um, has been a, a big part of our work for a couple of reasons. Um, we know that that um, you know, for example, that families headed by women of color are disproportionately affected by um, by housing instability um, due to their lower incomes. And you know, on top of that, um, when we're working and talking about the public housing institution HUD, particularly, which is your housing and urban development. Um, is the the largest entity which which provides um, you know support and resources to low income people, um, and just from the statistics we know that um, people um, of color, minorities, and specifically are disproportionately um, seeking service and receiving housing through HUD. And so when we look at women of color being disproportionately impacted um, with housing stability, we look at the number of people of color who are um, engaging in receiving services from from public housing, um, it is an entity and a system that we do need to prioritize and look at um, for those reasons of that intersectionality. Um, and so, in, in, on top of the fact that we have a, a large number of um, people, you know, lower income people and people of color intersecting with this system. We also know that, um, that that victims are intersecting with this system, and we've seen this through various legal precedent related to housing discrimination and public housing, um, such as, for example, the ability to seek um, emergency assistance. So, um, you know, previous to a lot of a previous to litigation, um, survivors were being evicted from their public housing um, because there were no protections in, in that system when they were calling and engaging with dialing 911 and seeking law enforcement. So they're being penalized for being victims themselves. And so um, knowing that, that survivors are with are, are working within the system um, is another critical um, piece for us to identify 
um, within that. And so it, it also has shaped a lot of the work that we have done um, kind of moving forward and with that lens, um, those legal precedents have, have come as a result, obviously, of, of survivors they're learning out of consequences. But also what that's led to is um, advocates having done a lot of work legally um, and to really challenge that, that system, the public housing system, to, to work for survivors and not be um, not negatively impact them um, when they're seeking assistance. And that's led to a lot of very thorough um, VAWA housing protections. So we, I say that all to um, to go ahead and identify that um, a lot of TCFE's work has been, um, there we go, sorry, we're <laughs> takes us a minute to click through. Um, um, a lot of TCFE's work has been um, aimed at looking at this specific, specific um, system, but also um, wanting to make sure that we're understanding what the needs of our community um, in particular really are. And so one of the ways that we did that was by, by administering um, a survey, and this is in, in conjunction and, and through technical assistance with CSAJ, um, and really asking our programs and housing lawyers um, what their experiences were, what their, um, you know, what they think or what they were hearing from survivors and what they needed um, with respect to maintaining safe and stable housing. And um, after being able to get that feedback, um, we looked at what the data said and really what they told us is what, what we've been hearing, but, but also, um, you know, they, to they told us that we needed to really, really look at state and federal housing protections and what that meant for survivors. And so as a result, um, we did a lot of prioritization internally on how do we make this information accessible and available to, to advocates as well as to survivors. Um, and then um, for over the last two years have done a lot of intentional and very strategic training, um, not only to DV advocates, but also to the greater um, homeless community and as well as pro bono, um, you know, lower income legal service providers. And so an example of that is um, when we were able to engage and do some training at the annual poverty law conference, which is strategically aimed at um, um, pro bono attorneys or low income attorneys that are helping um, um, persons out in the community. And so that's one of the forums in which we were able to um, identify the need and really tailor our technical assistance to the community. Um, in addition to that, um, another mechanism which we've really tailored our work, um, as Krista mentioned, we're on the policy team. And so we really want to make sure that we're looking at um, these structural um, inequities and, and means of, of oppression through a, through a policy lens. And so what we can do on that end and what we have done is to really look at an, and examine um, federal and, and local policy and state policy with respect to housing and their housing access, but also um, safety mechanisms within the housing system itself. And so what that's looked like for us is um, having a very uh, visible and continued presence on um, state level agencies, um, one of which is called uh, the TEACH, which is our Texas Interagency Council on Homelessness. And we're able to monitor state housing policy and advocate for survivors' needs within that system. Um, and what we've done over the years is really leverage that relationship to serve as technical to a technical assistance provider for other housing and homelessness communities. Um, so more recently, our work has taken us into uh, reviewing and um, assisting with with very specific um, documents. So, for example, providing technical assistance to our um, to the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs, which is our pass through for the majority of our federal housing dollars. So we've been able to look at documents that they're crafting um, and um, with a DV lens and, a, and an eye so that that system is being crafted in a way that's responsive and safe for, for survivors. And because of time, we're going to um, going to skip the child support section and just wrap up our, our portion of it. Um, but we are more than happy to talk about the work that we've done around child support, the public 40 child support system, and child custody here in Texas over the past 
few years. And we'll just end, we'll end with our last two slides and in terms of just saying that one of the pieces that we see as our main role, because our programs across the state of Texas are our constituents as well as survivors in our state, is to really equip the field with the best information and motivation and encouragement to do this work, as well as to really help connect folks in the field and advocates so that they can be the great connectors for survivors at the local level, and not just survivors that choose to come into local programs, but that we have local advocates going out to these systems, the local welfare offices, child support courts, housing authorities, et cetera, and that they have a presence and they have a voice within those settings so that survivors that go into those systems are, are met with better response. And so um, one of the other pieces we did want to um, end on are offering some concrete strategies. And these are pretty um, universal strategies that can be used for whatever topic um, you are looking at as far as when you're examining your systems for inequities or um, you know, levels of oppression. Um, so this, these different strategies can be applied in a lot of different ways. I think um, just pulling from today's survey and from, from the data and particularly um, you know, with respect to um, one of the identified topics was, was immigration earlier in, in the data. And if you kind of look at it from that lens, there can be very, some very specific strategies that um, could be um, targeted for helping survivors of color or immigrant survivors, whether it be information gathering and, and knowing what the law is, knowing what people's rights are, targeted outreach and, and um, targeted outreach to specific communities. And so this can mean a lot of different things. I mean, in Texas in specific, what that's meant to us is that we might have different regional strategies and different um, needs that are that are coming up in different parts of Texas because we are a very large um, state and have our communities have different needs. Coalition building, so from a lens of not just engaging DV folks, but uh, make sure we're in, in engaging anti-poverty folks. From a homeless lens, we need to have our um, homeless prevention folks on the, at the table. We also need to make sure that we're engaging state entities that are going to be a part of these different conversations. Um, act, you know, accessing um, campaign for DV services. So nowadays, we do want to make sure that, especially now in in um, with our communities of color having concerns about engaging services that we're proactively talking to survivors and letting them know that our services are always available um, and uh, being proactive about that. Um, and then finally, um, increasing informa information sharing, training opportunities um, all across the board. A lot of times that my kind of, my, my phrase on this is that information and resources are like candy. We just want to pass them out to everybody and allow everybody to make the best decision um, for themselves. And that's empowering um, our survivors and our advocates to um, make the decision that they know is right for themselves or for their community. And so with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Lisa, Lynn, and Sarah. Great. Thanks so much uh, to both Krista and Mona with the Texas Coalition, um, the Texas Council, excuse me. Um, I wanted to take a moment to ask our audience uh, what part of that latter presentation resonates with you? Sarah, can you go back one slide, please? I think the Texas Council ended in a great place where they talked about specific strategies um, that they have used, and I imagine that others can use or are now considering uh, in their advocacy. Are there particular go-to strategies that you in the audience have that you'd like to share? Um, are there things that you have heard either in this part of the presentation or the the information that Chick and Sada shared earlier that are resonating that you'd like to try out or that you'd like to, to have more information on. Please feel free to share those in, that information either about your strategies or about what resonates or about the questions that you have in the chat box. Sarah, see. you mentioned a national survey coming out from the National Alliance on Safe Housing. Um, 
that's a great example. And I think Texas, um, Kristen Mona, I think you all did a great job of kind of linking how national data um, can be then broken and further kind of synthesized at the state, regional, and local level and how that can help tease out um, some of the unique context um, to states and communities. And I think that goes all the way back to, Sarah, something that you were saying at the beginning about how we know a lot and yet we there are a lot of gaps in how we've conducted research with, um, with particularly with Asian and Pacific Islander populations generally and survivors more specifically. And so really starting to dig in and asking the right question and asking it to <laughs> um, um, and working with the survivors um, that um, we really want to um, kind of distill out those experiences is, is really critical. Great, and I'm seeing people talk about the importance of coalition building, about the ways in which they are using data in their work. Um, folks from New Hampshire are sharing that they're implementing a housing first model um, and that they're hiring. That's always good to know. Uh, advocates who are gonna work regionally to look at relationships with landlords and others to focus on getting people housed more quickly. Um, looking to see what, I, what else that I see here. The Family Violence Appellate Project, which is working with DV survivors in California, is working with an immigrant DV survivor whose husband refused to give her spousal support. And that their argument, I think, is that his promise of support was a contract with the federal government in the context, I think, of probably what he put on the I-864 form to keep his spouse from becoming a public charge. Sounds like this is what we, in the law, we call it a case of first impression. I think this is the first such case that's being brought in California. That's exciting. And then people who are focused on housing and homelessness issues and the Coalition for Human Needs are looking at a variety of system fixes, systemic fixes, these sound federal, related to HS, HMIS, excuse me, and policy issues. Are there um, other? Go ahead, Sarah. Um, I was just going to kind of throw that back at both um, API and TCFV, and maybe it, you would have different responses given your context. But for folks who maybe are part of a local program or on the ground, um, are there ways um, from the program that you work with or steps um, for um, folks either to get kind of um, to come to the table or to get tapped in into some of the bigger level national conversations that are happening around whether it's custody or housing um, or what have you seen that has kind of helped local programs get to kind of more macro levels and vice versa, some state and um, regional and national organizations to kind of pay attention to the local context. Do you have examples or thoughts there for folks on the call? There, there's actually there's actually an example that was just recently shared from Gabriella at NWIRP, which makes oh, one of those local to national um, connections. So it looks like they provide legal aid on immigration and that they have a VAWA unit um, that partners with local domestic violence organizations to create efficient referral processes and provide more comprehensive services to survivors through coalition building. Um, so connecting up the direct service piece with the coalition building and systems change piece. Absolutely. This is Krista from the Texas Council. And one of the things that we've really encouraged our local programs to do is to engage with their local continuums of care, which um, 
tend to, in, in our state, and I think increasingly across the country, are the conduits for the emergency solution grants funding that's coming down through HUD and really responsible for making local level decisions on housing prioritization and how um, housing assistance is going to be um, parceled out in that community. So we've really um, done a lot of work to educate the field about that network as well as to help them to engage, especially because there's been um, a historical disconnect between um, a lot of the homeless community and the homeless advocacy community and the DV advocacy community because of the domestic violence programs not entering into HMIS. And so I think we've been trying to really um, in, to help engage in that in partnership. Similarly, on the child support level, we have really tried to get the word out that um, child, the vast, the child support is a huge, huge system that the vast majority um, of unmarried but um, estranged parents um, are involved in, and particularly at the lower income levels in the state of Texas, and it also involves child custody. We have seen examples of local legal aids in the more rural areas refer someone that's wanting divorce and custody assistance from a legal aid straight to the child support system because it's because that's a free system, even though it doesn't represent either parent, but that they will come out of there with a child support and child custody order. So really making sure that advocates are aware that these are huge systems impacting survivors and that's critically important that they're um, engaged with those systems in their communities. Excellent. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank both the AP Institute and the Texas Council again on behalf of CSAJ and turn it over to Erica Sussman to do our closing remarks and talk about some upcoming opportunities as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Lisa Lynn. And um, thank you to all of our presenters today. That was um, really helpful information that gave us some incredibly useful framing as well as concrete applications um, and, and got us to challenge ourselves into um, thinking more about how to engage in impactful systems change work. So thank you so much for all of that. And thank you to participants for all of your input as well as as you are are and are continuing to share with us some concrete examples of your on the ground work. I want to share with you. Oh, I'm sorry. On that really sorry, Erica. On that really quick, um, some folks were asking about the child custody and support section we had to skip, and so before we go to our announcements and as folks are leaving, I want to let you know that. We will be posting the recording and the PowerPoint, and we'll make sure to connect back with um, Texas Council as well as the AP Institute um, to make sure that we've gotten all the resources, answered all the questions, um, and can provide that back out, out to you. So we heard that, um, that, um, that concern, and we'll make sure to get you all of the things. So thanks so much, and I'll back to you, Erica. Great. Um, so if you could advance the slide deck, wonderful. So first, I just want to let you know about, if you don't already know about um, a piece of this work that we and several partners are engaged in right now. Um, there are a series of listening sessions from margins to center listening sessions, um, WOCN, CASA, API, um, Texas Council, Kirwan, Southwest Center, and our consultants um, that I mentioned earlier are all engaged in um, these series of listening sessions. The goal of the sessions is to create a dialogue across the field to inform sur survivor-driven systems advocacy and practice recommendations that will enhance racial and economic equity for domestic and sexual violence survivors. So um, 
these sessions are upcoming and we encourage you to um, take a look at the dates and also they're going to be organized according to affinity groups. So um, as you'll see here on September 1st and 13th, the sessions will gather advocates of color who also identify as survivors. September 19th, lawyers and attorneys who are people of color and or aspiring allies. And on September 28th, um, economic justice and policy staff um, with, with coalitions um, will be joining us. So if you're interested in this, we encourage you to register. And there's a link here as well as more information about it on our CSAJ website. We have a number of um, webinars that we already have archived. So if you've missed any of the REAP webinars from the past, um, you can get those recordings and all of the information that came out of them on our on our website and also at this link that appears right here. Um, coming up, we have on August 24th, a webinar on race equity and practice, and this will feature the learnings um, from our impact sites that we've been um, privileged to be working with the um, Oklahoma City Artists for Justice and Enlace Comunitario. Um, we'll be featuring some of their work. On October 26th, uh, there'll be another webinar that focuses on strategic learning and race equity reports and recommendations. And again, this will be coming out of the listening sessions work that I just mentioned. Next, okay, great. There are a couple of resources that um, were mentioned along the way today and perhaps some folks have already accessed them, but if not, I just want to bring them to the surface and make sure you know about them. Uh, a couple of months ago, CSAJ released a guidebook on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. It's a comprehensive survivor-centered guide for domestic violence advocates and attorneys. And it features um, different chapters on a variety of aspects of consumer and economic civil legal advocacy, all authored by folks who sit at very unique intersections of consumer and economic civil legal advocacy. Um, you'll see some of the topics listed here, but really this um, resource came directly in response to hearing from folks in the field who wanted um, just these types of concrete advocacy strategies. So we're thrilled to share this compilation with you. And the next resource that I wanna mention um, also came out um, this past winter, and that is an atlas for direct service providers. It's called Accounting for Economic Security. Um, this is the first map book of what will be a three map book series in an atlas. And this one focuses on mapping the terrain. Um, it really uh, suggests a framework for engaging in radical economic justice security work for survivors. And um, some of these points right here really uh, are the guideposts that guide this, um, this resource and the approach that's put forth. So I encourage you to access that on our website as well. And then here are some key CSAJ um, resources that have been developed over the course of the past decade or so. Um, the first is a needs assessment that um, was conducted back in 2012 and some of the findings from that in terms of gaps and opportunities for economic justice advocacy and consumer lawyering. Um, the second is an article on economic ripple effect um, that appeared in the DV report. Um, another resource features some of the work of TCFB as well as other amazing demonstration sites in our pilot site report. And then of course, there's an assessment tool for attorneys and advocates that focuses on building partnerships for economic justice. So all of these resources and many, many others along with the webinars of the past can be found on CSAJ's website. And we encourage you to take a look. And speaking of the assessment tool, if you haven't already taken the the, the race equity self-assessment, um, I would really encourage you to do that and to have colleagues and to kind of share it out because we're doing a similar thing that we did um, with this economic advocacy assessment tool where we're really going to take the learnings and the thoughts from you all 
to create a resource and a guide for you to have these conversations within your organization to think about um, how to think about partnership and that cross movement work and as you devise your own strategies. So that's sort of a piece of where all of this is is going. So I would really encourage you to to take that or reach out to us and participate in those listening session calls because um, all of these resources Erica has talked about really tie into one another and we're excited about it and we're thrilled and privileged to, to learn from you all in that. So um, just another plug there. Wonderful. I want to thank uh, Lisa Jacobs for um, facilitating today's call and Sarah for um, engaging in such um, rich thinking around the data and the coordination. And of course, I want to thank all of the faculty who participated today, as well as participants. Um, with that, I have nothing else um, other than to ask whether Lisa or Sarah have additional thoughts before we depart. Nope, just to thank our fabulous intern at CSAJ, Steph, for all her technical tweeting and other invisible but indispensable assistance today. Any oh, final thoughts you. from you, Sarah? Yes, ditto to all the people playing all the parts. Um, thanks to Steph, thanks to Kristen Mona from Texas Council and Sarah and Chick from AP Institute and to you all for joining us. Um, really um, incredible and rich information. We're excited to where this will lead next. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Wonderful. Take good care. Thanks everyone for joining. <laughs>